So if you were to read the Gospels, all of them, Mark, Luke, and John, very closely, one of the things that you would discover is that there are only 11 events that manage to be included by all four Gospel writers. The baptism of John, the feeding of the 5,000, Peter's confession, or in the final week of Jesus' life and ministry, including Mary's anointing of Jesus, the, full entry, the Last Supper, the trials, the crucifixion, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection, and the one that Lorraine just read to you which is a bit of a continuation of last week's story of Jesus's time in the Garden of Gethsemane, which can also be found in Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 18. But for our time, what I want us to do is take what Lorraine just read and unpack that. I want us to look at Matthew's account of the story. Now, just kind of to catch you back up, if you weren't with us last week, Jesus and his disciples have just finished their last supper together. They've gone out to the Mount of Olives, where they found a small garden that overlooks Jerusalem in order to pray. Prostrate on the ground, Jesus enters into what would be the dark night of his soul. And while he is praying, his disciples were sleeping. After encouraging them to watch and to wait, and they're falling asleep on him multiple times, he finally finishes what would be his last time of prayer. And then as he sees his disciples sleeping, he wakes them up once again. Let them know that finally his time has come. And what I want to do is I want us to revisit what we just heard from Lorraine, but this time I want you to listen as if you were going to be given a quiz. I want you to think about what is a familiar story, and I want you to pay attention to the things that strike you funny or that stand out in a certain way that cause you to question, to wonder, to be disturbed. I want you to think about this story, and I want you to enter into this story in a way that it becomes personal to you. So. Matthew chapter 26, I'm going to read it again, this time as if you were being quizzed. I want you to listen. Now, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of his 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by their leading priests and the elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and he gave him a kiss. And then Jesus said to him, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him, for those who use this sword will die by the sword. Then Jesus said to the crowd, am I some dangerous, dangerous revolutionary that you would come with swords and clubs to arrest me? But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. And at that point, all of the disciples deserted him and fled. So. What stands out from the story? Is it the way that Judas approaches Jesus? Is it the way that he greets him as if nothing's wrong and kisses him on the cheek? What audacity it would take for one of Jesus' closest friends to sell him out in this fashion. Or maybe it's the way that Jesus responds to Judas. Put yourself in his shoes for a moment. If one of your closest friends would totally sell you out, betray you, and do it in such a fashion, would you call them friend? 
And would you invite them to continue with that action? Or would you resist it? Maybe it's the response of one of Jesus's other disciples as to what is going on. In John's account of this story, we're told that the guy with the sword is Peter. In this version, we don't know who it is, but John tells us that it's Peter. Are we surprised here that he pulls out a sword, that he's actually packing, that he's ready to fight? Maybe it's Jesus's response to Peter's act of violence in restoring the man's ear and telling him to put away his sword and telling him, if you live by this sword, you will die by this sword. Maybe it's Jesus's response to Peter's need for violence. Or maybe it's in the end, the final response of Jesus's disciples when they all run away from him. He is unwilling to defend himself by any means necessary and they see how it's going to go down, that they actually leave him there by himself alone. I don't know what it is in the story that speaks to you, and maybe there are multiple things, but I want you to enter into this story. I want you to find your place in it. I want you to discover where maybe you're surprised, or maybe you're disappointed, or maybe you're encouraged in some way. What do we learn about Jesus from this story? What do we learn about his disciples? And better yet, what do we learn about ourselves? Rubbing the sleep from their eyes, the disciples, or at least one of them anyway, Luke says that more than one attempts at this point of the story to take matters into their own hands and to justify their use of violence. And so in doing so, he pulls out a sword and he slices off the ear, not of a soldier, but of a slave. Is he angry? Is he afraid? Does it even matter? Is this the way of Jesus? Or has Peter lost his way? You know, sometimes we can get so passionate about issues that matter to us, issues that concern us. Racial equality, sexual orientation, gun violence, abortion, pandemics, vaccines, mask mandates. You get the idea. We get so up in arms about what we think is right and what we think is wrong that along the way, we somehow feel justified in saying or doing whatever we feel necessary to get our own way, to win the day even if it means doing violence to those with whom we disagree. Peter is just in this moment so out of sync with his teacher. But it's not the first time, is it? As things began to escalate, Jesus rather quickly puts an end to the violence. And in doing so, he invites those who would follow him to something different, something higher than our natural base instincts. You see, embedded in his response lies the invitation to go far beyond what comes natural to us in order to meet hatred with love and violence with peace. Because when push comes to shove, all of our religious dogma does very little for us. If our hearts are directed by anger and violence and even fear towards those who oppose us. The unarmed Christ disarms us and gives us another way in which we are to take the pain that we experience and transform it rather than retransmit it to others. And in doing so, perpetuate an ongoing and endless cycle of violence. Jesus' path takes a very different direction because truthfully, He came to conquer by way of the cross and not by way of the sword. Early Christians understood this act as the final death blow to the use of weaponry. Believing Jesus' words to Peter were meant to disarm every follower of Jesus. No longer could any Christian legitimately justify violence towards anyone, even their enemies. In fact, early Christians insisted that for Christ, we can die 
but we cannot kill. We can die on behalf of others, but we cannot kill for them. Why? Because Jesus had abolished the sword in this space once and for all. In the story, Jesus invites us to put down our swords, to love our enemies, to stop being so reactive, to stop allowing anger and fear to govern our responses. And perhaps the only way we can do so is by creating a regular rhythm where we turn to God and pour out our hearts in his presence, much like Jesus did in the garden, and discover in doing so that, in fact, he invites us to a different way. At the end of the story, the question for each of us is, will we accept the invitation? Now, initially, the early disciples, they RSVP'd absolutely no. And we know this because they all ran away and deserted him when he needed them the most. When he wouldn't do things the way that they wanted to do, they left him. They failed the test. What about you? With our words and with our deeds, we are either people of peace or we are not. And the way that we become people of peace is by looking at and listening to our lives and discerning where we are and how we're being governed in the way in which we live. If anger is guiding us, if bitterness is leading us, if fear is govern governing our lives, then peace cannot. Jesus gives us clear instruction about how we are to meet force. And he invites us in doing so to respond in kind. The question is, will we? It's much easier said than done, but it's the way of Jesus to which we are called. And the way in which I invite you this day to consider in your life how you can make application in places where it is very difficult to do so, to become one who makes peace in your home, in your school, in your workplace, in your world, and not just waits for somebody else to do it. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for for the scriptures that teach us things about how we are to live. We must convey doing so the lessons are hard. The invitations only become more and more difficult as we follow Jesus into places like this dark night of his soul. We ask that you would help us to consider our own lives, and how sometimes, because we want to be right, because we get passionate over things that we care about, because sometimes we're not thinking about a higher, better way, that sometimes we inflame situations. Sometimes our words and sometimes our actions only make things worse, like pouring gasoline on a fire. We're so undone by what others say and do that we feel the only way to get back is to meet them with the same kind of force. But would you illumine our mind and help us to see that that is not the way of Jesus? Our lives are to be a light that guide others into the truth. Would you help us to be those people this day, today, tomorrow, and every day? In Christ we pray, amen.